So I'm going to open with prayer, if you don't mind. Father, as we begin to talk about a very important and very confusing topic in our day and age, I pray that you would give us your heart about this, give us the ability to understand, give me the ability to speak with clarity and, and charity. And I pray that we would feel better equipped to minister to those impacted by a loved one saying, I'm gay. Thank you for the opportunity for us to minister with and to each other in this time. We surrender our time to you, in Jesus' name. So, um, I, I'm gay. What do you do? Right? Shocking words. Frightening words. Angry words. And they're devastating in the ramifications. Um, I'm Warren Lamb, Director and Lead Professor of Vancouver Bible Institute in Vancouver, Washington. We are the seminary for the layperson. So we provide seminary level education for everyday people. We are the Pacific Northwest Regional Training Center for IABC, and I'm the Area Coordinator for Washington and Oregon. Um, I tell people I'm a recovered psychologist. Dr. Buckley kind of alluded to that a little bit today, because I, that's the world I came from. Um, and a lot of what the, the psychology world talks about, about the things that we're going to talk about this evening, they approach it from a position that um, is diametrically opposed to what scripture says. So when Cher first heard these words, I'm gay, from her daughter Chastity, she threw her out of the house. Barbara Streisand had a little bit easier time accepting her son's homosexuality, but his admission not long after that about being infected with AIDS was crushing. Um, Liza Minnelli found out about her first husband's homosexuality with walking in on him while he was engaged with, in an encounter with a man, but she shared the same fate as her mom. She was married not once but twice to men who were later found to be homosexual. Uh, comedian Joan Rivers uh, was spared a similar fate. She found out about her, her boyfriend's homosexuality before they got married. There are many, many people like that, but you've got uh, Hollywood people, you've got politicians, you've got Christians, you've got Dick Cheney, Pete Knight, Pete, Senator Peter Knight. Uh, you've got uh, Philip Yancey, anybody heard of him? Did anybody ever read his uh, book, What's So Amazing About Grace? A very powerful book, because he writes extensively in that book about his friendship with gay activist Mel White and the tensions about what, what the relationship went through when Mel came out. And then uh, Stephen At, uh, Arterburn, how, can I, how, how Will I Tell My Mother, tells us about his gay brother's battle with AIDS. And some of you may have heard of Phyllis Shafford. She uh, found out that her son admitted to being gay, Oral Roberts. Uh, discovered his son's homosexuality after he committed suicide and went to the suicide note. So this impacts people all kinds of ways. Well, often the first question that is asked is, what do you mean you're gay? Now that might sound like a silly question, but it's actually quite reasonable. What does that even really mean? Because you can talk to a thousand people that have heard that phrase and ask them what that means, and you'll get a variety of answers. So we're going to talk about that a little bit of, a little bit of clear, get a little bit of clarity. I get phone call after phone call after phone call. My son's confused. He thinks he's gay, right? And so I say, well, um, how long has he thought that? They either don't know or they don't believe the answer they got. So there's a, what we call a, what I call a cacophony of emotions. There's shock, there's confusion, there's denial, dismay, anger, and just agony. 
the number one thing that I hear over and over and over is I feel like he died. I feel like he died. And they'll say things like, if she continues down this road, she'll die separated from Christ and be lost forever. That's a death. I hurt so bad, I wish I could die. I'm so scared he'll die of AIDS. <laughs> I'll just die if any of my friends find out. His father will die when he hears this. What will people at church say? I'll just die when people find out. There's this attitude of death about all of this. And in a way, there is a death. But what's died is not their loved one, but their understanding of who their loved one is. Because suddenly, the version of their loved one that they've held on to for so long is not the version of their loved one that they're presented with. So suddenly, their entire, the wheels are just like come off their life. They have no idea. They're just, they don't even know how to think about all of this. Uh, they may have been lied to, directly or indirectly, and that shatters their long-held belief that the relationship was founded on honesty. Um, they realize that he or she has this huge secret, even a secret life, and there's been no indication at all to them. How could I not have known? Why didn't I see this before? All kinds of questions like that. I thought he shared the same values. I thought she believed what we believe, and suddenly they find out that's not okay. True. And then in the case of a spouse, the underlying assumption of a monogamous marriage has been demolished, and the person they thought they were married to has been murdered in the streets. It's even worse sometimes. Imagine the wife standing in the hospital room, listening to the doctor explain about her husband's blood sepsis and pneumonia, why they're unresponsive to antibiotics, because HIV has degraded his immune system too far for the medicines to be effective. She had no idea. And suddenly, he's been come out through the doctor. She had no idea whatsoever. A matter of fact, there's a gal that's part of our network of ministries who deals specifically with the people impacted by homosexuality and gender confusion. And um, uh, maybe, maybe several years ago, some of you remember that um, um, Ellen DeGeneres had a girlfriend that they kind of connected at the Oscars. Um, does anybody remember that actress's name? Huh? What? I'm sorry, what? Anne. Yeah, Anne Heche. Yeah. Well, her mom is actually one of the primary teachers in the network, or Sword Hope Network, a network of ministries that deal specifically and she talks about that. And she found out her husband, this is her story, she found out her husband had been, was homosexual when she was standing in that hospital room in New York. Mm. So, all, so whether the loved one is a child, a spouse, um, what, what you have is you have these long-held hopes for the future just shattered. Um, they're obliterated. So what has died is the picture they had of their loved one. They actually know more about them now than they ever really did. Too often, though, <clears throat> you're disgusting. You make me sick. You're going to burn in hell. Now, this is normal reaction, anger and fear and all of that. The problem is it's not only unhelpful, it's hurtful, it's hateful, unbiblical, and unchristlike. <clears throat> Ephesians 4, 26 eight tells us, be angry, but do not sin. It doesn't say don't be angry. But it says be angry, but don't sin. So vengefulness and wrath are sin. Righteous anger motivates us to recognize a problem and correct it. It's about reestablishing a sense of justice. But wrath destroys and damages. Anger seeks to correct wrath. Correct wrath seeks to punish. We may need to remember what James says in James 1.20, the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. If there's a personal component, that's the wrath of man. If you don't have that sense of it's, it's against me, I've been hurt, violated. Mm -hmm. My expectations have been disappointed. If that's missing, you're probably on the path of righteous 
the indignation. But if that personal component's there, that's the wrath of man, and you're going to make mistakes. The thing is, as biblical counselors, we get confronted by this. They've already done this. How do we help them navigate through that? The second question we often get is, how did this happen? How did this happen? Where, where does this even come from? The answer to this is complex and never really complete. Uh, there are so many factors to go into that we're going to talk a little bit about this. But we can kind of sort out constructing an understanding, at least, of why their loved one no longer fits the image they had of them in their mind. The question asked over and over is, what are we supposed to do now? And that's where we come in. Because we're coming in, okay, so the ship is plowed into the reef, it's burning to the waterline, what happens now? How do we, as biblical counselors and disciples, help them? We have been tasked by God to walk with people through the process of understanding and dealing with the aftermath of this kind of disaster. And it's probably the most shocking announcement a parent or sibling or spouse can hear. To be able to deal with that biblically is what we are tasked with doing. And what we want to talk about here tonight. To understand a person does not require you to agree. It simply helps you communicate more clearly. And that's one of the key points, points I want to make is we have to be able to find ways to talk about this because you're not going to change that person's mind. You're not going to be able to say a prayer and boom, suddenly they're not gay anymore. You don't even know what they, how they, how, what they mean by that. When they say, I'm gay, what does that mean? How do they understand that? To understand does not require that you compromise your belief. It simply helps you navigate through matters that matter. I just want to understand, what is this? If the family affected holds to a biblical worldview on human sexuality, then the biblical counselor is a solid foundation to work from. You've got a lot you can work from. But if not, then there are even graver matters at issue. And you may be of little, if any, help. So it all comes down to, do they have a biblical construct or not? That's what you have to start with. I have counseled many families over the years, dealing with a shock and discovery. They want to know what they did wrong. What did we do to make this happen? Did we, did we do something wrong? Did we break them? Did we damage them? <clears throat> what can I say to change his mind? What can I... You know, what do I do if my daughter wants to bring her lesbian lover home for the holidays? Uh, uh, how do I respond when, when they say I'm homophobic and bigoted? What do I do with all of that? All of this stuff is going on, just this, this turmoil. Wives have sat in my living room. Our counseling setup is like a living room. They're, they're absolutely shattered and confused because they they had no idea that their husband was attracted to men at all. But let me tell you what I what we know statistically across the spectrum of ministries like ours that work with people like that. When we have a couple sitting in front of us struggling in their marriage, especially if there's a sexual component, 41% of those men either have had or are currently involved in homosexual relationships, 41%. You mean as they come in for actually marriage counseling, mm -hmm. 41%. And I'm talking about there's hundreds of us that do this kind of work, and these are across-the-board statistics that are consistent in every ministry. Um, so the answers, for the biblical counselor, the most important question to ask is, how do I help families impacted by homosexuality? Navigate biblically through the confusion, the shame, and the grief. The answers to these and other questions that arise depend on the view we take. Oh, there it is. What view do we take on the nature of homosexuality and our duty as believers? Because that's where we part from company with the world often. Um, there's a lot of discussion that's taken place within the church in recent years about homosexuality and all matters related to that. If we're to respond effectively within the context in which we live and serve, the questions that we have to ask have good answers for. Here's our mandate. 
We urge you, brothers and sisters, mourn, not the tao, those who are in discipline and unruly, comfort the discouraged and fearful, help and strengthen the weak, be patient toward all. First Thessalonians 5.14. This is our ministry center's ministry philosophy. This is our counseling center's ministry philosophy. Well, when you're dealing with somebody, you can, they're, either, they're either rebellious, fearful, or weak. Or there may be a confluence of those things at any one time. So being a little bit agile and being able to tell what's happening with this person right now is very helpful. Um, but this is what we do consistently. Here's something amazing. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor the effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some of you. Such were some of you. There's the hope right there. Such were some of you. You were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of our God. Matter of fact, one of the ministry leaders, um, Master of Life Ministries, uh, Dave, Dr. David Kyle Foster, has actually done a video called Such Were Some of You. And do you guys remember the old, some of you are old enough to remember the, the, the Hertz commercial that had the young blonde guy and the pretty little brunette in the car with the convertible Hertz? That, that was actually, uh, Deborah Winger was the blonde and David Kyle Foster was the, was the actor. So let's talk about six common situations. Parents with a homosexual adult child. Parents with a homosexual teenage child. Spouses with a partner who's homosexual. Children with a homosexual parent brothers and sisters with a homosexual sibling and those with a homosexual extended family member. These are the primary areas in kind of that dynamic order that we run into. So biblically counseling those struggling, personally struggling with same-sex attraction is a completely different workshop. We're not going to be able to get into all of that. Um, and how does a church construct a biblical paradigm for ministry? That's another workshop that, that we offer as well. Tonight we want to really talk about how do we as biblical counselors really help people. And um, if you go to Restored Hope, what is it? Restored Hope Ministries.org.com. Restored Hope, no, Restored Hope Network.com. Sorry, Restored Hope Network.com. There's a whole lot, list of ministries. You can find counselors in whatever area you're in. There's a lot of resources available. Again, restored. restored hope network.com we we actually um, when we saw Exodus international some of you remember Exodus a few years ago starting to implode a lot of us saw that coming so we left um, and we established restored hope network that all started really started in January that year and by September we had our first conference officially formed Restore Hope Network. So, and that's been probably four years ago now, I think. Flashing in my mind was this wonderful son who was so bubbly and happy, such a joy to have around. Thinking of him entwined with some other male brought heaves of heavy sobbing from Dean Poole's bag. Barbara Johnson wears a mother go to resign. It's a very real thing. It impacts families every single day. And it is agonizing. It does feel like somebody's died. So how do we help those families who've been impacted by same-sex attraction and gender confusion? What's our response? Well, first of all, it has to be biblical. It has to hold fast to the clear teaching of Scripture. If we believe that the Bible alone is God's Word, and as such is the full final authority in everything that it addresses, then the primary tool that we have to use is properly interpreted Scripture. That's where we have to start. It must be Christ-like. Combines grace and truth. Okay? Grace without truth is license. Truth without grace is harsh. 
We don't compromise the truth, but we speak the truth with a high regard for God's gracious best for someone else. Threatening, degrading, demoralizing, insulting language. It's just completely out of bounds. We just can't do it. Also has to be authentic. Combines humility and compassion. No one is immune from being taken captive by empty, deceitful philosophy and our own rebellious and idolatrous nature. The paradigm of me as a biblical counselor, as a paracletos, or someone who comes alongside another and who brings comfort as an instrument in the Redeemer's hand, it's a must for me to hold on to this. Or I can't be any help. I'm just going to exacerbate the problem. I become the problem to them. I become the, the, the thing that they have to battle and not the real enemy, which is one of the primary distractions the enemy voice on us. At this time in history, when gender and sexual confusion is reaching phenomenally unexpected heights of um, confusion and disorientation and violation of God's standard, the church needs to boldly stand on the beauty and power of God's life-giving word. That's what we always come back to. What does God say about this? We, we can't be afraid to discuss with empathy and understanding the issues that are central to the human soul, especially when it comes to sexual and relational issues. We need to be able to proclaim the power of God to redeem individuals and families from sin's control, no matter what the sin is even the sin of homosexual behavior. And we have to be able to walk alongside them as they seek freedom. Prokletos, the proper focus of one who comes alongside, gospel-centric, not issue-centric. So we focus on God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting the trespasses against him. He's provided the remedy. So it's about the gospel, it's not about the issue. It's Christian versus non-Christian. This is what the Christian worldview is. This is what the non-Christian worldview is, showing that clear delineation, demarcation. We have to center on Christ's likeness. And we have to be fearless. Fearlessness doesn't require aggression. Just gentle firmness. Because if you really believe the truth, you don't have to be belligerent. You don't have to be belligerent. If you're belligerent, you probably don't have the faith that you think you do. As biblical counselors and disciples, we are charged with walking alongside those whose lives have been ravaged by the sins they've committed, the lies they believe, and the evils they've suffered. That's across the board what we do as biblical counselors. When you're dealing with somebody who's attracted to someone of the others of the same gender, they're confused about their gender identity, impacted by someone else's confusion as a parent, a child, or a family member, or a pastor, leader, or a friend. If the church cannot be a source of hope and guidance and healing, who can be? The world? Absolutely not. You have a 13-year-old boy going to talk about being attracted to, to his male friends, and he's going to get the counsel to embrace his homosexuality. What? You've got to be kidding me. That's not what God's word says. There's no hope in that. I get a little passionate. There's only one who has every answer and every solution that we need when it comes to life and godliness. Isn't that what 2 Peter 1 verses 3 through 8 tells us about? It? But if we want to have, if, if, if he intends for us who are willing to have a future and a hope, we've got to pursue what he has to say about it. So let's talk about some of the scenarios that we run into. A married man has committed adultery with another man. Sometimes people say, I never thought of it that way. But he's married, and he's having sex with another man. That's adultery. We're not talking about the homosexuality. We're talking about the adultery. Here's what's going on. Hang on a second, I want to go back. So she's legitimately angry for having been lied to, betrayed, maybe even physically endangered 
by being infected with a sexually transmitted disease. She, she's like, you lied to me, you broke our vows, you may even have infected me. Of course I'm furious. But now what? what do you, how do you help her? What does she do now? You have a son who, who has been using gay pornography in his parents' home, knowing how strongly they would inject a porn in any form. We can get focused on the issue and not on the sin problem that's underlying it, the heart problem, the idolatrous heart problem that's underlying it. His parents are legitimately act, uh, angry over his lack of consideration for them, their home, the values that they've established and what God has said. That's the rebellious heart attitude that's under, underlying. Yeah, they're like, you brought things into our home that you knew we would never allow. You completely disrespected us. You disobeyed what you know, what we taught you, that God believes is said is good and right. And we're the ones that get to decide what comes into our home, not you. That's all normal stuff, but how do you help them deal with that in the aftermath? A man marries a woman without telling her about his homosexual attractions. She discovers suddenly that she's been misled. She's been lied to. She's been deceived. There's a whole aspect of his life she had no idea about. She's like, you let me believe one thing that you knew wasn't completely true, and you deliberately covered up that you are turned on by men. You didn't have the right to do that, but how do you help her through that? How about this one? A daughter takes financial support from her parents, including money for rent, while telling her she lives alone or has a roommate, when in fact she's in a lesbian relationship. We see this more and more and more. There's been an 800% increase in lesbian activity starting with 14, 13, 14 year old girls on up in the last four years. And again, this is the stats from the RHN uh, member ministries. So basically, she's been willing to accept their support. Basically, they're funding her sin. Yeah, they're angry, legitimately so. Because she, the daughter has manipulated them, lied to them, and used them. But now what? This one we're dealing with right now with a family. A man demands that his family recognize his relationship with another man as a marriage, threatening to come to cut them off if they want. They, they can't understand what, what do we do with all this. Well, basically, this is a narcissistic attitude bow down at the, at the foot of the king and do whatever his bidding is. That's what this is about. This isn't even about the homosexuality. See, homosexuality is a symptom. Belligerence in the homosexuality is a symptom of a problem. It's not the problem. It's a symptom. So, what is homosexuality? I could, do, I could talk about this for about four hours. We actually have, uh, uh, don't worry, I won't be. You mentioned time, I just made the So there's three options for believers. It's a viable, normal lifestyle. If that's the case, then our approach would be identical to our approach with heterosexual matters. The only difference lies in the gender attraction, which now is a non-issue. Demon possession. Holding to this approach, prayer, fasting, exorcism will deliver the homosexual from the demon the spirit of homosexuality and bring them to true and lasting freedom. The problem is scriptures nowhere ascribe homosexual behavior or any besetting sin pattern, for that matter, to demons. Or is it an idolatrous sin pattern? This is the position taken by the clear teaching of scripture and by decades of research, observation, and thousands of transformed lives. 1 Corinthians 6.11 So by normal inborn or genetic, God-ordained, morally acceptable, and promotable. If everything that's inborn and genetic acceptable, do we accept everything? I don't know. Why does Rogaine sell so, so much product for pattern baldness? If everything in, I mean, you're, you can, you, no, but it, we talk about that. It's a logical fallacy. God-ordained, did God ordain this? No, God created them male and female. Be fruitful and multiply. You can't do that in a homosexual relationship. So it's not God ordained. Morally acceptable and promotable? Well, 
what's morals? What's the problem is is that we have language. They switched the price tags on morals and ethics. Morals comes from the word mores, which is norms, and norms are determined by what is collected, what's what what is relative to the society. Ethics is a transcendent. Uh, what's your plumb line? If you have a biblical ethic rooted in the nature and character of God and His Word, absolutely not. That's what your morals will be based on. So a simple definition, it's same-sex attraction. Same gender, same gender attraction, same-sex preference, same gender preference, those are all things. It could be male or female, but basically it's attraction same to same. That's what it means, same to same. An enduring pattern of emotional, romantic, or sexual attraction to a member of the same gender. The bottom line is, and I could go into a lot of detail about this, but here's what happens. It, you've got homosexuality is three tiers. It has three different levels or dimensions. It's condition or an orientation, behavior, or an identity. Okay? In, in other words, not all homosexuality is equal. This, when, I did, when I learned this, this was so powerfully helpful to what I was facing in, in counseling ministry. Condition orientation, it's involuntary or discovered. How many of you can remember the day you chose to be attracted to the other opposite sex? You discovered it, didn't you? The same thing with same gender attraction, same sex attraction. It's discovered, they suddenly realize it's there. Now, they choose what they're going to do with that, just like all of us do. You know, if somebody's, if all he's attracted to is other men's wives, well, he's got to decide what he's going to do with it, right? He can't just act out on it because it's normal for him. It appears early and is in deeply ingrained. Um, there are certain things that we notice uh, about young, young men especially who end up same-sex attracted and engaged in homosexual relationship. And there, there's some real common, common themes to talk about in just a minute, but uh, a lot of it is in adolescence and stuff, in, in early teens, the boys are sitting around talking about, oh, Sally and Susie and Jennifer and Steve sitting and saying, yeah, but Peter, that's how I feel like you. And he's like, oh, wait a minute, what's going on? You know, this, I'm confused. You know, he discovers that what they're describing they feel, but here's the problem. We are created by God to be attracted to other. If he does not feel masculine, if he does not feel male, if he does not feel like he's part of the male world, guess what? Male and masculine is other, and that's what he's attracted to. It is that simple, that foundation. It really is. We're naturally attracted to other. They felt rejected, undermined, not accepted, don't fit in the male world. And so male, masculine is other. Um, one of the guys that, that uh, helped me a lot in discovering how to minister in this area, Mike Geck, talks about his own thing. He says, look at this. He pulls his trousers away. See these skinny, white, these skinny legs? He says, and no matter how much I worked out, I couldn't get beefy legs. So guess what? I was always attracted to men with bulky legs. He says, because emo it becomes emotional cannibalism. You know, the, the Native American kills, the, the, kills the, the bear, eats his heart, thank you for the, and he gets that power, that strength from him, right? It's the same kind of thing. Not, I want to be like you, I want to be with you and maybe vicariously draw that. And that's really what happens, it's that broken. And we see it over and over and over and over. Lesbianism is completely different. That's a whole other whole nother type of same-sex attraction. That has to do with relationship and intimacy. Um, there's behavior, sexual involvement with a member of the same gender. And it can be actual or vicarious. Now, what's important about this is that there's this clear distinction between attraction and action. There's a buffer between the, the pernicious hold that same-sex attraction has when it's only attractable. Once it moves into action, now we have the physiology 
Now we've got the body involved. So the, you have this brain, body, heart, soul, emotional dynamic. It's because we're synergistic whole, so suddenly we have everything, become all aspects of the human being becoming co-conspirators in this. When we say, but actual is a lot more dangerous than vicarious. Gay pornography is not as difficult to, to break the bonds of as somebody who's actually engaged in same-sex behavior with another person in the same gender. That right there, there's a whole groove of things that have happened in the mind, the soul, the emotions that are really, really difficult to break. They can be. They are, often are. Then you have identity. Primary identifying life characteristic and acceptance of homosexuality as normal and morally correct. This is where the I am statements come from. I am gay. And it's often very militant. I am my sexuality. This is my identity. Well, if that's our identity, then where's identity in Christ possible then? It really isn't. So I am statements, and even any kind of biblical counseling, listen to the I am statements of the people who are coming to you. Listen to those. I am this. I am that. One of the things I often say is people say, well, I, you know, I just feel like I'm a failure. I said, I said, let me tell you something. That's like saying you feel like you're a leprechaun. And they go, what? I said, if you look in God's word, do a word study, you never see failure connected with a person. Strength fails, hope fails, faith fails. Plans fail, but people never fail in God's word. We miss the mark. Even the word for sin in the New Testament is fall short of the mark. There's no such thing as a human failure. So to feel like a failure is to feel like you're a leprechaun. You just cannot be that. These I am statements are absolutely critical. Very freeing. Um, not everyone who experiences same-sex attraction or same-sex behavior goes on to self-identify as gay, so it's tiered. So, why is their loved one homosexual? Is it their fault? Why do we want to find fault? Why do we want to... We've been doing that since the garden. Well, the woman you put here with me. Yeah, well, the serpent. And, of course, the serpent didn't have a leg to stand on. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Homosexuality is multi-causal, developmental, and three-tiered. We talked about that. So let's talk about multi-causal. There's a social environmental that has to do with what you're around. If you're in envi an environment where, where homosexuality is accepted, that will become accepted. But it's even more than that. Um, we call it psychological. It's psychological and it, it has to do with the soul. We were created as gendered beings. Our sense of male and female is a core identifier. We say, I met this guy, I met this gal. We automatically categorize by male and female. It's automatic with us because what did God say? He created, he created them male and female. That's the Imago Dei. That's the image of God. And he said, what? Be fruitful and multiply. Make a babies. Okay, male and female making babies. That's the normal thing. So if the soul gets mangled in the, in the process of the developmental things, it's literally the soul has been damaged. We don't use, in our ministry, we don't use psychological the way the world does. Because how, suke logia, how do you study the soul from the perspective that man doesn't have a soul? Sorry, you can't get it from there. Emotional? and behavioral. All of these things combine. So you have a, you have a boy who um, feels rejected by dad. Dad calls him a sissy boy. That kind of stuff. So now he feels rejected, emotionally rejected. He doesn't fit. Mom and his sisters and his aunts are accepting. So he feels very comfortable in the world of women. Very uncomfortable in the world of men. You also have that environmental factor. And the behavioral. I know a lot of men who are former homosexuals, but they still sound like it. And I asked one of the guys one time, I says, I gotta ask. I says, why do you still sound gay? And he just kind of laughed. He says, you know, I know a lot of people wonder that and they don't ask it as much as they want to. He says, but if you grew up in Alabama, what do you think you talk like? 
He says, I grew up with nothing but women. I took on their mannerisms, I took on their culture. So it's not, doesn't mean I'm homosexual, doesn't mean I'm gay, that's just my, my accent. Um, the homosexual individual suffered from a lack of identification with the same-sex parent and that upon entering puberty, the unsatisfied childhood needs are eroticized, which results in the individual seeking to fulfill these legitimate needs with people of the same gender. If you want one of the best books, most definitive books on understanding homosexuality, Elizabeth Moberly uh, wrote Homosexuality and Christianity in 1983. She's from Great Britain. Yeah, there's a lot of psychology language, but she really breaks it down and understands it. As a matter of fact, one of the primary tools that most of the people who've gotten free of that life have used. Elizabeth Moberly, Homosexuality and New Christian Ethic. Oh man, I gotta hurry up. Okay, multi-causal. There's oversensitive, compliant, always a good boy. Okay? Um, he tries really hard to be a good boy because he doesn't want to make anybody mad. He cries easily. He's very sensitive, emotionally sensitive. He's because here's one of the things that um, think of it this way: most men are born with eight emotional Crayolas. Most women are born with a box of 256. Okay, so men, we've got light green and dark green. We don't know from forest green, kelly green, shamrock green. No, no, no. Light green, dark green. Just give me that. Okay? But there are some boys that are more emotionally connected to their world. And so they're going to be more sensitive to those kinds of things. Well, guess what? That makes men uncomfortable. What does a man do when he sees a woman cry? Right? He comes up unglued. What, 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 how do I fix this? I don't even know what it's at. What did I do? Right? We do. We kind of run around in circles like we've got no idea what's happening. Stop, 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 stop. What? Stop, 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 stop. They're creative more than athletic. I worked with a family several years ago. One boy's 10 years old, and he's very creative, not really athletic. His younger brother, who's six, is very much like that, likes to hunt and stuff like this. So I'm helping them through how do you, how do, you do this. And I said, he doesn't want to shoot the deer. Give him a camera so he can shoot the deer making, taking pictures. And Dad's looking at me like, it's still shooting the deer, right? <clears throat> but it's creative and not destructive. And they just looked at me like, wow, what a great idea. Well, I borrowed it, so I can't take credit. That works too. Huh? That works too. Yeah. Partial to more feminine activities. They feel very comfortable in the kitchen, not in the garage. And they have an aversion to roughness in sports. They don't like loud noises. They don't like loud voices. They don't like the rough and tumble. They're not comfortable in that world. So they retreat from those things. Well, if they get pushed away at the same time they're retreating, they reject that world because they feel rejected by that world. So then you have the same gender detachment. You have the parent absent or uninterested. And it can be no, no fault of theirs. It can be in the hospital. It can be incarcerated. Or if they just really are absent. Dad is so focused on work, he's not involved in the family. Same gender parent house is hostile, rejects them. We see that often. Insecure, overly strong attachment to the other parent. We see a, a triangulation happen often. We've got, don't talk so mean to him. Do, you know, don't be so rough with him. And so that, that you have this attachment. And a lot of times, you'll find what, what we call emotional incest happening between the mom and the son because dad is uncaring and unsympathetic, but the son is very sympathetic, very connected. So now you've got another form of abuse going on underlying all of that. Uh, rejected feels unsafe in the same gender world. His peers call him a faggot, a little, you, you know, you little, you, you know, you little prissy boy, stuff like that, you sissy. So he doesn't even feel safe in the same gender world of his peers. Poor peer attachment. They taunt him, they tease him, they name call. They don't choose him to play in any reindeer games. They're more secure with the opposite gender and reject 
the rejected feels unsafe in the world of his peers. He just doesn't. And one of the things we find happening is they'll be drawn often to older. You'll have adolescents. That's why pederasty, that's uh, adult gay men who are sexually active with um, pre, uh, pubescent and prepubescent boys. That's why that happens a lot. If any of you heard of MAMBLA, the North American Man Boy Love Association, they really believe that that's normal and right, and they're actually following the agenda of the pro gay movement from the 80s to try to get that accepted and normal. Matter of fact, last year, um, uh, the Australian, the AB in Australia, tried to get um, pedophilia accepted as gender or, or uh, sexual orientation instead of a crime. It's coming. It's coming. Um, so you got abuse, you got sexual abuse, physical abuse, verbal abuse, emotional abuse, spiritual abuse. All of those forms of abuse are this. It violates God's created order. It's a gross violation of God's created order. He's created an intent. When that happens, the soul is mangled, the heart is wounded, and you've got a mess. I can talk about and that's this abuse is my primary area of counseling specialty. Um, then you add puberty. This really helps. <coughs> they got stress over their sexuality in, when they're prepubescent. They doubt that they have doubt and sexual stressors and they actually inhibit brain development. There's, there's, um, uh, they end up with late development of these, the, the of their ability to be attracted to the same, same gender. Um, and then you've got poor or late physical development. Like they don't get, you know, hair in their armpits or whatever, like the rest of the peers. Okay, I want to jump. I have a lot more here than. Okay, so let's go down. I want to skip this. Uh, huh? I'm sorry. Well, just think gender is a biological certainty. It's a biological certainty. That's right. Period. Just know that. Christians ought to seriously consider how our careless use of any of these labels, same-sex attraction, homosexual, gay, confuses the language of faith. It would be more feel fitting for the church to speak if someone is experiencing same-sex attraction to refer to him or her as homosexual, gay, or lesbian. Churches always view Christianity, Christian identity in terms of a relationship to God through Christ. And this is our, this is our anchor point. This is where we start. Once the church succumbs to the idea that our basic identity is sexual rather than, rather than theological in nature, then the church has already lost its way as we get into the discussion. So let me hurry up. Okay, so what are they to do going forward? Here's our context. So, does God exist? Yes. That's where we start, right? Whose version of God is correct? And what does God require? That's where we start. It starts with our theology. But directly related to that is our anthropology. Who and what is man? Why do we exist? This is where the heaviest part of the battle is. What is the purpose of humankind? And what's our destiny? Our anthropology and our theology are closely linked. Because don't forget, we're creating the image of God. There is a natural order. And then our morality. Who or what determines right and wrong, good or bad? What's our plumb line? Is there a transcendent ought, or are we left to self-determine? Do we accept the mores of others? Those three areas, the areas of worldview, are going to be the primary thing. You have to determine that, and you have to find out where the people you're counseling are with that. Because otherwise, you've got no idea whether you're using the same words meaning the same thing. Okay. Fact or fiction? On average, 10% of the population is homosexual, with a much higher number being male than female. Fiction. Last part is true, but the first part, based on US census numbers, less than 1% of the population self-identifies homosexual. That's contrary to what we see in the news, isn't it? Yeah. Homosexuality is genetic. Researchers have found the equivalent of a gay gene. <clears throat> fiction. 
No scientifically accepted replicable studies exist to clearly demonstrate homosexuality is genetic. <clears throat> How about this one? Jesus never addressed homosexuality in the Bible, never teaches anything against healthy, love, loving same sex unions. That's fiction. There's a great deal the Bible says about homosexual contact, especially when Matthew, when you te- in Matthew 19, Jesus says that the only acceptable sexual expression is within the confines of monogamous, lifelong marriage. Male, female, heterosexual. That's all, that's all Jesus, he said, that's it, all that's accepted. Homosexuality is a personal matter, doesn't it? Isn't really anybody else's business. The impact of sexual activity on those involved has always been a matter of responsible, uh, uh, responsible concern for society. So three, uh, um, okay, the general context that we are living in today accepts and affirms homosexuality and transgenderism as normal, good, and right. The view is repeatedly endorsed in the media, entertainment, music, and literature, even that of our children. And I mean. Um, there's a, uh, an organization called the Commercial Closet, and they keep track of print ads and everything else on television. And they give ratings to companies for promoting this. Um, there's a, uh, a master gunnery sergeant from Marine Corps that I've known most of my adult life. And he said, you know, when we went in, he said um, uh, homosexuality was illegal. He said then it was don't ask, don't tell. Then it's accepted. He says, I'm getting out before they make it mandatory. He says, because that's the way we're going. So there's three options for us as believers and the people you're counseling. Do we agree with what the culture says? Do we agree with what my experience says? Or do we agree with what the scriptures say? If we're here, we're rock solid. Every story relates. Like divorce, homosexuality touches every person in our society. <clears throat> Um, my loved one is gay. How can I say that they are condemned by God? How do you say that? How do you do that? Are they condemned by God? Go to the list in 1 Corinthians. Go to the list in Romans 1. Go to the list in, list in Galatians. Are any of those, anybody condemned for any of those? Well, it depends. Is it serial, unrepentant? That's usually the qualifier, isn't it? If it's serial and unrepentant, yes. If, it's not, if, if they're struggling, if they're battling against it, that's an indication of the Holy Spirit's real work. What is true? Our theology is a commitment to a set of intellectual and emotional ideas about God and man that drives one's decision making and actions. Basic working definition of theology, right? So everyone has a theology. The question is, is it a good theology or a bad one? Everyone's a theologian. Everyone is. Even an atheist has a theology. That's right. What we believe is what we live. We cannot do otherwise. That's what you're looking at. So, stage of truth. If you're, if you're watching the stage play, you've got the stars at the front, you've got the supporting cast in the center, you've got the, the walk-ons, and then you've got the stage crew, right? Evangelical stage of truth. Scripture, tradition, what, the, what Christianity is historically held. You've got reason, what makes sense. As I think about these things, what's consistent. General revelation, everybody has a conscience. Everybody. And what's normal? Well, across the board. And then experience and emotions are way at the back. When you start moving these to the front, what have you usurped? Who becomes a star? Not Scripture. And Scripture alone is, a, is authoritative in all matters that it addresses. We talked about that earlier. So, um, oh, I gotta quit. I'm so sorry. Okay, let me run through this. Action plan for parents. Where the Bible's adamant, they need to be adamant. Where the Bible is op- was silent, they need to be open to discussion. If they hear something that clearly contradicts scripture, they need to reject it. If they hear something that the scripture scripture doesn't really address, they need to be willing to talk about it, to consider it. Um, But if it's something affirmed by scripture, they affirm it. So it's really coming back to what the scriptures say. So here's what you do with help the parents understand this. 
When your children are born, you exercise authority, care, and influence. Right. As they get a little bit older, you exercise authority and care. They get, usually your influence evaporates when they get into high school, sometimes even middle school. The peer group is a greater influence. So all you really have is authority and care to exercise in their life. But when they become adults, you're a consultant. That's it. And we've got, we've got grown children. And we pretty much are consultants. So what they need to do is, we can still influence as we speak the truth from God's word, from God's heart. So we need to have, we need to say what, when you say you're gay, what does that mean? What do you understand about homosexuality? You know, <clears throat> um, are you still deciding, or have you decided? You know, are you, help me understand where you're coming from. Are you decided and gay affirming? Are you undecided? Are you decided but not gay affirming? Where are you? Find out where they are, because you'd have no idea what you're talking about or how to talk about it without them. Then the parents need to clarify their own position. This is where we stand. This is what we believe. Scripture clearly teaches we have to stand on that. Then they need to articulate their fears and ask some questions. I'm afraid you're going to get AIDS and die. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm scared to death that the, with the high rates of alcoholism and abuse, I mean, in Denmark, the highest number of domestic abuse reports are in lesbian relationships. They need to talk about their fears. So, oh, shoot. I need to quit. I went way over time. Um, here's what we know we are created beings we're created by God with a specific design and intent and that includes our sexuality the created intent for the expression of human sexuality is fulfilled only within the covenant of a lifelong monogamous and heterosexual union we are rebellious and fallen race and the fall has marred every aspect of our existence Homosexual behavior is both a manifestation of the fallen nature and a violation of God's created intent. Homosexuals, like all people, are redeemable by God. That's what the cross is about. God's desire is that none would perish, but instead that all would come to repentance. 2 Peter 3 and 9. And one of the most powerful things you can remember is we are like the people standing around after Jesus has raised Lazarus from the dead, four days dead, he stinketh. Lord, he stinketh. There's rot, there's decay, putrefaction. The lies they believe, the sins they've committed, the evils they've suffered, that's all of that. But guess what Jesus says to the people standing there? Unbind him, set him free, let him go. Let him go where? To live out the life. But guess what? As the unbinding happens, it gets stinkier and stinkier as you get toward the center until it's completely unbound. That's our role. That's what we help the parents navigate through. And if you will pray, say, Lord, grant me your wisdom. Give me your heart. Help me be your voice of grace and truth. You'll be amazed, amazed at what he does. And I'm sorry for running over. Well, I don't care about anybody else, but I've got to, I'd like to ask some questions. <laughs> well, I mean, I... Yeah. If, until they throw me out, I guess I can. Last call. Last call, yeah, I got um, You know, when it, um, my granddaughter just committed suicide a year ago, um, and you know, it was it was so horrible. And I, I wanted to reach out to her partner, and I just have not gotten the way to go do it. I mean, just walk in and say, hey, you know. I'm let, let me give you a, let me give you a way that and I've had to address that. <clears throat> One of the things that we say is, you know what, the loss you've experienced was never intended by God for any of us to have to experience. When we re, when we push back against the loss of a loved one, we're actually agreeing with God that we were never supposed to experience that. So that's a starting place. That's a starting place. And be able to say you felt this deep love and attachment for it. okay? So that's, so you start ministering to their sense of loss. Minister to the need of their heart. Once you've done that, 
don't forget, Jesus ministered to the, to the felt needs as he ministered to the real needs. He didn't do one or the other. He did both. Hey, well, you brought up the good question earlier. <laughs> do I, because, uh, you know, obviously with somebody brings up all sorts of questions, do I give them to spend the night? But, I mean, like, they're coming for dinner. I mean, I, to me, I would think, well, they're coming to eat. You know, the Bible talks about if they're believers that you're not to eat with them. But that's right? serial, unrepentant, serial, unrepentant sexual sin. Right. So are they really believers? Because if they're not, you don't deal with them the same way. Right. Are they really believers? If they're serially unrepentant, chances are they may not be. Huh? Yes. That's... Let me tell you, every conversation you have as a biblical counselor, every conversation you have is redemptive in nature. Amen. Well, I think that you would treat them the same way as if she was living with her boyfriend. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Right? Would you let them come to your house? Because we over-focus, we over-focus on the gender attraction, yeah. which is a distraction. That's right. Bill? You see them as a person. Yes. Don't worry about gender worry about who to see them as a person and you have to say this person needs Christ. Yeah, can I well, let me spring from that. Every human being was created in the image of God. Every human being, even Adolf Hitler, has inherent worth and value to God. To their creator their creator. That's our prime our initial focus, just like Bill says. We start there. Because if we don't we're really not acting as true agents of grace and truth. Well, I, wonder, I wonder if anybody's ever had a conversation without going at that, you know, going at a different angle. If you said attacking and going after a deeper issue rather than just saying, hey, look here, let's stop that. Do you know what? The opposite of homosexuality is not heterosexuality. The opposite of homosexuality is holiness. Yeah. Exactly. Isn't that what all, the opposite of all sin behaviors yeah. is holiness. That's what we're guiding them to. We want to guide them to the place where they understand what it means to have Christ indwelling them by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what we start, because apart from that, there is no hope for them. But once they have that, there's all the hope in the world for them. The seed's got to be turned first. Well, you know, it's taking the label off. I mean, yeah. you know, because that's not the issue. We, we several years, uh, Portland, Portland, Oregon has one of the most famous... Uh, gay pride festivals because it's always Father's Day weekend. They do it on purpose. And the, they, have a, they have a festival down at the waterfront and then on Father's Day they have the gay parade and it is militant. It is just, you can feel it in the air. Well, we've done a prayer chapel. We are the only non-gay affirming evangelical ministry that is not only allowed but in, actually invited. We provide a prayer chapel. We have a sign up that says, all, everything matters to Jesus Christ. Okay? And we say, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. That's what we start with. So we have a box out. We say, if you don't feel comfortable having someone pray with you in person, please put your prayer requests in the box. And every hour, our volunteers will take, gather those and pray for those. And people will come up and they want to get into the conference. We said, what we're here to do is we're here to let people know that you whatever's going on in your life matters to Jesus Christ. That's where we start. Yeah, I, wonder if, I wonder if anybody that's in a Christian life has come to them and said, hey, there's a better way. I'm sorry, way. what? I just said, I wonder if anyone's come to them and said, hey, there's a better way. Because I, when uh, me and my fiance, she was my fiance at the time, but we went up to Toronto the day before they, they basically unleashed and said, like, homosexuality is okay, you can be married. Remember when that happened? And there was a church right next door, and it said, every day is a pride day right outside. And we, we ate a restaurant where every single waiter seemed to be homosexual. And I was wondering if anyone had ever pulled them aside and said to them, there's a better way. Like, if you are feeling like you were lost, and you said, like, the culture basically says, go after it. The culture told me, I was raised in a family that said, go after every female in the world. I would be like, okay, great. My life's great. But, you know, thank God I wasn't, and thank the Lord saved me. But I wonder if one of the questions I often ask is, have, you, have, your, have your ideas about this changed over the recent past? I want to find out where they are and how they got to that point. I'm going to do some investigation. I want to find out. I want to, 
because I can't, I really don't really know what kind of a conversation to have with them until I find out where they are and how they got there. Like you said, you don't compromise your beliefs by understanding where they come from. Yeah, because otherwise we may not, I may be talking about something they don't really care about, but if I'm able to connect with them on something that they care about, now we got common ground. Think about that. Paul did it. Jesus did yeah, it. Did. You know, they all, they all, the, the, the Jesus and all the apostles did that consistently. They met people where they were, and they talked to them about about their paradigm. And if that's where we start, then we, remember, as proclamators, we come alongside them, and we guide them. Yeah. Okay. If we're not doing that, then it becomes about admonition and obedience. Oh, you're getting it wrong. You, you need to do this instead. We don't even know for sure where they are, so we don't even know what the instead is. Because often we're looking at symptoms and not what the underlying brokenness is. And I tell people, look, and I, I've been doing biblical counseling, biblical counseling for 29 years, and I've been doing counseling for, I don't know, 35. Um, I tell people, I am not wise and insightful. I just crawl around in the crawl space under the house looking at the foundation. That's what I look for is break, broken foundation. All the rest of it, if I see a crack in the wall, I say, I gotta go under the house and look for that part of the foundation. That's what I gotta look at. If you start looking at the foundational problems, that's what you really need to address. Everything else is symptomatic. A pimple on the face is not the problem. There's a chemical imbalance inside the body. That's right. Heal the onion. Huh? Heal the onion. Get to the core. Unbind him, set him free, let him go.